Okay. Uh, but I gotta I gotta warn you about another mismatch, uh, and I'll get part way into it, and then we'll we'll have to break until Monday. Um, so I'm going to derive the acoustic wave equation, and um, we're going to see that that you know this actually doesn't work. Okay, uh, we can't uh, we can't have constant velocity and have a reflectivity section with the the equation that we're using for uh, for migration. Okay, uh, in in fact, it's uh, it's quite remarkable, uh, and it doesn't. Doesn't make any sense to the uh, uh, to the traditional earthquake seismologists that migration works at all. Okay, it it just shouldn't work. It doesn't. It violates all the assumptions that we're making. All right. So so uh, uh, you know all of this has to be solved uh, later on. Uh, but it would be unfair of me to teach you all these migration methods and then claim that that you know the physics in them is perfect. No, the, we're, what we're going to find out with this acoustic wave equation analysis is that the physics actually is is faulty. Okay, how about that? Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to set up a uh, a situation for a two dimensional uh, acoustic wave equation, and uh, I'll get through this page, and then we'll break until Monday. Um, so two dimensions, we've got a little uh, volume of fluid. Um, and uh, it's moving in response to pressure gradients. Okay, so the uh, this little element of fluid, you know, has a density rho, and it uh, it moves laterally at velocity u, which is dx dt, right, where x is the uh, the location of that little fluid element, and it moves vertically at velocity w, or speed w, which is dz dt, right? U and w are uh, are scalars. Okay. Um, and you know, there's a whole grid of fluid elements here, and, and every fluid element has its own u and w. Uh, and there's also a pressure field in this uh, 2D world. Uh, so we have pressure as a function of x and z. So pressure is varying over uh, spatially and, of course, in time. Okay. And with these x and z axes, you can tell that I'm I'm looking at the model space, at the image space. It's a real cross section. So uh, each fluid, you know, if we want to collect together all of the uh, fluid elements, you know, they have uh, vector uh, velocities, and the vector uh, lateral velocity component is uh, the scalar u uh, uh, velocity, you know, which is going to vary uh, depending on location in x and z, times a basis, a horizontal basis vector x, okay, which is you know one. One meter long, and uh, uh, and then there's also a velocity field, uh, a vertical velocity field w, written as a vector here with a little arrow above it, which is a uh, uh, you know the scalar w field, which varies in x and z times the uh, the z basis vector, uh, also one meter long. Okay, so let's start with uh, uh, let's let's you know write down some of the basic physics that. Uh, that controls this uh, the movement of those fluid elements. Okay, so there's F equals m a. You know Newton's uh, what is that second law? Um, and and how do we write that down for this fluid element? Um, the uh, the force is uh, minus the gradient of pressure. Okay, so pressure is a is a scalar field, right? And we take its gradient and we take the negative, and that's the that's the uh, direction of the uh, of the fluid movement, and of course, uh, uh, in this um, volume uh, specific uh, equation, uh, instead of mass, we have density, and then uh, the acceleration. Of course, well, we got two uh, we got two components of acceleration horizontally for u and vertically for w. So we're multiplying the the density rho times uh, the uh, horizontal acceleration, which of course is du dt. Plus the vertical acceleration, of course, as a vector, right? Dw dt, and and we can just pull these out, and and then instead of having to use the vector u and the vector w, I can just use the scalar w and the scalar u. So, uh, you know, here's the gradient. Here's here's the x-direction equation, uh, minus dp dx is equal to 
uh, rho times du dt, and uh, the uh, the z direction equation minus dp dz is equal to rho times uh, dw dt. Uh, and uh, okay, I think I can define the uh, uh, the uh, the second principle here. This is a uh, um, I mean, really, we're just uh, we're talking about uh, where energy goes, you know, kinematic versus uh, elastic, okay? But uh, and I forget the name. This is a constitutive relation, all right? The uh, <clears throat> so we can store energy in the pressure field, uh, but as that changes in time, that makes the uh, uh, you know we have to have changes in in uh, changes in the uh, 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 in the in the density, we have to have divergence in the velocity field. So uh, uh, minus d p d t is equal to the incompressibility k times uh, the um, divergence. That's del dot uh, the uh, and here's the velocity field, which you know I just write as separately uh, as uh, uh, the vector u plus the vector w. Okay. Now k, as you as you might know. Uh, you know that can vary in x and z, right? The incompressibility depends on the geology, uh, and I didn't say it yet, but the uh, so does the density. All right, so the potential energy is uh, part of the uh, equation is minus dp dt uh, is equal to k times, and now you know putting the dot product into here, and and uh, then we just you know end up with the the scalar parts of the uh, of the velocity field, k times du dx plus dw dz. Okay, so we got Newton's second law. We got the potential energy relation. All right, and uh, on Monday I'll build the uh, the uh, uh, the wave equation. You know, it's going to be a simple acoustic wave equation, and um, and then we'll see how we're completely violating it. All right, <laughs> with all of our assumptions, and uh, uh, so hopefully you'll see how that uh, how confusing that is. Okay, so now we have the setup for the uh, uh, scalar wave equation. We've got the uh, Newton's second law, F equals ma, and we have the uh, constitutive relation, uh, which basically is showing um, how uh, energy goes between kinetic energy uh, with uh, control by minus uh, dp dt. The pressure p, of course, is our uh, uh, Wave field in time and space uh, equal to the incompressibility k times uh, uh, the quantity du dx plus dw dz. Okay, so uh, now we'll put those together. The uh, the uh, 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 f equals uh, m a is underlined in brown. That part the um, Constitutive relation is underlined in uh, uh, in green. So uh, here's uh, uh, the parts uh, written right next to each other, and of course, for a wave equation, what we like to have is an equation that's purely in uh, uh, in p, right? Uh, it's it just describes the pressure field and its uh, time and space derivatives, and that that will now allow us to get the uh, the spatial and time evolution. But what we've got here is um, uh, we've got all these other things too. Um, you know, we're going to have uh, density and incompressibility in there. Uh, but also we've got the uh, the wave fields, right? The uh, uh, I'm sorry, the velocity fields u and w, u being the horizontal velocity and w being the vertical component of the, of the velocity, which of course varies over space and time. So both of these. Uh, uh, both the time derivative of that of u plus w, and the uh, divergence of u plus w, both of those are non-zero. So we'll take uh, three. Okay, so we have uh, minus one over rho times the gradient of p is equal to uh, the time derivative d dt of uh, u plus w as uh, vector fields, and um, let's take the uh, Divergence of both sides of that uh, relationship, so uh, del dot uh, minus one over p uh, times the uh, uh, 
the uh, gradient to p, uh, the wave field, the pressure field, and then del dot the uh, time derivative of um, uh, u plus w, the velocity field. Of course, uh, this uh, del here is spatial derivatives. The diver divergence is a spatial derivative, and ddt is a time derivative. Okay. So uh, let's let's write out here exactly what we mean, right? Because we have uh, the idea that uh, you know density and uh, and uh, well velocity uh, will can vary in space, although not in time, and um, so thus we would like to have density and incompressibility varying with uh, uh, with space, but not time. And so, what exactly is going on here with the uh, del dot minus one over rho uh, gradient of p? Okay. Well, you know, just writing it out, uh, we got a minus sign out here, uh, and then uh, here's the whole operator that's operating on p. All right. So it's uh, an x derivative operating on one over rho, uh, operating on another x derivative um, plus uh, the uh, uh, the z derivative operating on one over rho, uh, operating on uh, uh, another z derivative, and then that whole thing operates on p, uh, and um, the uh, del dot d d t. You know that we don't have to change that, and that's underlined in blue now. Um, now we're going to take uh, the uh, uh, the constitutive uh, relation part uh, that involves the incompressibility k. And so we have uh, minus one over k times d p d t is equal to del dot uh, u plus w. Okay. Now uh, we're trying to find something common so we can eliminate this uh, u plus w that's in in blue above in the Newton's second law part. So I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to take the uh, 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 I'm going to take the time derivative of both sides. Okay, so um, I have uh, ddt times minus one over k dp dt. Okay, is equal to ddt times del dot uh, u plus w. Now um, I said already that uh, the incompressibility k it varies with space, but it doesn't vary with time. So you take its time derivative. And you get zero, okay. So it can come all the way outside the um, uh, all the way outside the uh, uh, the derivatives, right? Because it doesn't. Uh, it's a constant as far as the time derivative is concerned. K is a constant, even though it varies in space. So what we have here is minus one over k uh, d squared p dt squared. Okay, second time derivative is equal to um, and now I'm going to bring down the uh, the blue underlined part from uh, no I'm sorry is equal to uh, uh, ddt times uh, del dot um, u plus w. Now notice uh, these two blue underlined parts. You know the first one is is del dot ddt, and the second one is ddt del dot. And uh, there's nothing in between there to confuse things. No no k or or rho or or anything else in there. So they they are the same. Uh, five, the right hand side of five is the same as right hand side of six. Okay, because so they're the same. So we can equate the left hand sides of the equations. All right, and what we end up with is a two D acoustic scalar wave equation. And uh, here I've got it as one over k d squared p d t squared is equal to del dot and then one over rho varying in x and z. Okay, uh, del P. Now notice uh, uh, I've got uh, you know I, I couldn't just make the you know del dot del would be del squared the the uh, the uh, Hamiltonian I think it is so um, um, we um, we'd like to take this row out of here like we took the k out of the middle of the time derivatives but you know we've got row that varies in space right so we can't just take it out it has to stay where it is. Okay, so this is kind of unsatisfactory because it's not simple enough yet. Uh, so we use our experience, okay, uh, between different materials, 
uh, density might vary, uh, you know, different rocks anyway. Density might vary from a low of 1.5 to a high of 3.5, at least for crustal rocks that we can conceive of. So that's uh, you know a factor of a little more than two, right? But the incompressibility between you know water and different rocks and um, soils and all that, um, you know, mantle rocks and crustal rocks, uh, that varies by orders of magnitude. Okay. So maybe we're not losing that much if we, um, if we say, all right, any differences in velocity we're getting are really entirely due to the K variations, the incompressibility variations, and not really due to the rho variations. So we're going to take rho, the density, and we're going to make it a constant. Okay? So instead of having a spatially variable rho, rho of x and z, we're just going to have a constant rho. And then we can bring rho or one over rho out from underneath the spatial derivatives, and then we have uh, one over k times uh, uh, d squared p dt squared is equal to one over rho times uh, uh, d squared p. All right. And on the left hand side we have time derivatives. On the right hand side we have spatial derivatives. Okay, in x and z in particular for this two D example. So here's a, a, a nice, simple, easy scalar acoustic wave equation. It's the one that we, that we used. I've written it here in a form that is valid for two dimensions or three dimensions, right? So I'm not saying what del is, and that depends, so that depends on the setup. Um, so uh, we have, um, uh, this is what generated our uh, downward continuation in the Fourier domain that we've been using. You know, to derive the FK migrations so far. Uh, this is uh, also related to the uh, superposition migration that we developed so far. So it's what we want. But you know, right in there is a uh, is an assumption. Okay, and it's a pretty grand assumption, and it, you know, falls apart everywhere. Um, the assumption that the density is constant. That's how we got the uh, the row, the one over row, out of the middle of the spatial derivatives. And you know one problem that we have with this is that you know we have smooth velocity and rough um, impedance r. Okay, so you know v is equal to k over rho and uh, in square root, and r is equal to square root of k times rho. All right, if p is constant, then v and r cannot have different uh, um, cannot have different values at different length scales. So we've got a total tautology here, and you know later on we'll have to find a better way. But for right now, we just have to put up with this. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So this scalar wave equation for constant uh, density is useful. All right. We can test a trial solution, which is a monochromatic wave. This is uh, the pressure field is uh, in x y, x z and t is equal to e to the power of minus i omega t plus i k x x plus i k sub z times z, right? That is a monochromatic wave. It's got one frequency omega, one um, x component of its spatial uh, frequency k sub x, and one z component of its spatial frequency k sub z. And we substitute that into the wave equation, number eight up here. OK. So um, uh, d squared p dt squared is uh, 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 just writing it, you know, Clearing the uh, the k over rho, right? The, now v squared is equal to uh, k over rho, and so uh, dp uh, d squared p dt squared is equal to the velocity v squared times del squared of uh, uh, of p. Okay, and there's v squared k over rho, and so we have um, uh, then we substitute in the uh, uh, the monochromatic wave. Okay, which is uh, if you remember the uh, the monochromatic wave, you know this is this is one Fourier component. This is uh, you know you, you take a Fourier sum to create a, a wave, and you have lots of these at different frequencies omega, and different kx and different kz. All right, so uh, uh, we substitute that in, and we get something that's actually rather familiar. It's just the Fourier transform. Uh, 
you know, via the um, uh, the Fourier theorem of the wave equation. So first we have d squared p dt squared is equal to minus omega squared times p, and um, uh, del squared p is uh, uh, equal to minus the quantity kx squared plus kz squared times p. So we put the whole thing together and we have um, omega squared times p is equal to v squared times the quantity kx squared plus kz squared times p. And then notice uh, in this equation here, we can just divide uh, p the wave field, right? Why would we want to do that? Well, uh, that means that you know after we divide out p, the remaining relationship is going to hold for all the waves that hold to this scalar acoustic wave equation. Now we know for constant density. So we have um, omega squared over v squared is equal to kx squared plus kz squared. And that, of course, if you remember, is our dispersion relation that allowed us to derive the impulse response of migration and downward continuation geometrically, and also led to the uh, fk migration method. So we see the dispersion relation okay, that we've been so reliant on here you know, to get kz when we were given omega v and kx, right? That, semi that circular dispersion relationship is true only at constant density. Okay, uh, how about that? Um, so that's uh, you know really homogeneous uh, density part, uh, and we'd have to go to a lot more work if we uh, had heterogeneous density. So here's uh, you know what you get if you try to make a dispersion relationship out of heterogeneous density, right? Using that monochromatic solution, and at least I can't get anything useful out of it. Okay. Uh, turns out, though, that this does uh, lead to um, some interesting analyses that were done later, uh, back in the 90s, by uh, Clairbout students, and they solved. Uh, they got uh, interesting dispersion relationships for uh, anisotropic media, and uh, to some extent for uh, heterogeneous media. Now, the this problem of having um, the um, the the density under the spatial derivatives. You know, we can solve that numerically, and uh, you know, while right now we're coming up with closed form solutions to uh, our downward continuation problem, um, we're going to uh, shortly learn some ways of uh, solving these equations, even the heterogeneous parts, uh, in um, uh, numerically uh, by uh, by iteration. Uh, so we'll get to that when we get to finite difference techniques. Okay. So uh, that's a little bit of information, again, on the background of what we're doing and uh, the actual wave equation we're, we're using, number eight here, and uh, how uh, under this uh, now we know assumption of constant density, how it leads to our familiar and useful dispersion relation, which we're going to keep using. You know, no, We're going to keep using these assumptions. Uh, I need to uh, take a look at a, um, uh, a feature of... Um, the uh, uh, a feature of the migration and the downward continuations we're using, and the migration solutions that we have, uh, called evanescent energy. Okay, this occurs uh, in our um, uh, our solutions for the uh, um, our, our Fourier domain, our FK migration solutions for the uh, um, uh, for the dispersion relation. Okay. So uh, for now, we're going to look at some more consequences of the acoustic uh, constant density dispersion relation. So here's the dispersion relation. Remember that? Um, omega squared over v squared is equal to kx squared plus kz squared. It's a circle, of course, in the kx kz plane. And it's a triangle, uh, you know, straight lines in the intersecting straight lines in the uh, kx and omega plane. Okay, Could, could also be... Uh, uh, there are situations where it can be hyperbolic as well. So uh, let's let's take uh, uh, kz equals zero and plot it in the uh, omega and kx plane. And of course, what we have here is that the absolute value of omega is equal to v times the absolute value of uh, kx. So uh, if you can ignore the red parts of this diagram first, in purple we've got uh, kx kx axis and the omega axis. Okay, and um, you can see here that uh, a constant ratio between omega and kx, in other words, a line, 
the, one of these green lines in the diagram, the constant ratio between omega and kx, is uh, a constant velocity, right? It corresponds to a, a constant um, constant v. Okay, so now um, um, you know we might be migrating at a depth uh, z zero. Okay. And v will have a lower value, okay. You know, even we have that you know pretty common case where velocity increases with depth, and we'll only consider those uh, places where uh, uh, velocity increases uh, only with uh, velocity changes with depth only. So we don't even have uh, lateral, laterally varying velocity, okay. So uh, uh, low velocity is going to be up here close to the kx axis. And uh, we go from some depth z0 to some greater depth z1, okay, and we might have a higher velocity. v is equal to v at z1, and z1 is greater than z0, and v at z1 is greater than v at z0, and that's going to be closer to the omega axis, okay, it's going to have a, a greater slope uh, for the uh, larger velocity. It's going to be closer to the omega axis. Um, now, um, so the area that we uh, that we are uh, uh, you know the effect of the velocity in the uh, uh, omega kx plane is uh, going to have an effect on what happens in our process of um, of uh, uh, downward continuation in our solution to that problem. Okay. Uh, now, one thing that we have no doubt about is that we take a real data set. And we uh, we two D Fourier transform it into the kx and omega domain. You know, there's going to be energy everywhere here. Okay. Now I should give you the tools to uh, plot that out, but uh, uh, haven't done that. It that that is left as an exercise to the uh, uh, to the student. Um, but you'll see that any real data set is going to have energy all through this whole uh, this whole plane. Okay. So the um, the Fourier transform of the data, right, uh, p of omega and kx, has placed energy throughout the omega and kx plane. Um, and migrating at a higher velocity places more energy, you know, there's more of the omega kx plane into this region close to, in red, close to the kx axis, which is called the, uh, the evanescent region, okay? And actual propagating waves, you know, like ground roll, surface waves, they can get caught in there. Um, you know, anything that's uh, that's too slow. Okay, so that could even be reflections that are coming from uh, up above. You know, from lower velocity regions uh, up above, we're migrating, say, at the you know our medium depth velocities, and that means the shallower areas with lower velocities are going to get caught in this. Uh, uh, in this area, close to the kx axis, and in this red so-called evanescent region, okay, and uh, there's always going to be something caught there because uh, we, uh, you know, our data uh, sets are going to have energy everywhere throughout the whole plane. Now, um, you know what happens when energy lands in this uh, 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 close, to, too close here to the kx axis you know basically it's a, it's coming at a velocity that is um, uh, lower than the green line that we're using depending on the velocity we're using so in the evanescent region the absolute value of omega is less than v times the absolute value of kx so let's see what happens to our downward continuation operator and so here it is we have the uh, 2d Fourier transform data p of kx and uh, omega and then we um, uh, after downward continuation, we end up with key p at uh, of kx and omega at a particular depth z, you know, which can be non-zero now. Downward continued, and we get there by multiplying the original Fourier transform data by e to the plus or minus uh, i times z times this uh, a solution to the dispersion relation, right, which we've not just validated, okay, which is the square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus kx squared. Now the um, you know what's under the radical uh, kz, it, it becomes um, complex, right? If uh, if it's we're too close to the kx axis, right? Um, then uh, 
uh, and and omega is too too small relative to uh, to v, then the kx term will dominate, and uh, um, and really what we have is uh, we can get a square root of the you know we don't we we get a, a what's under the radical becomes uh, uh, under the radical uh, becomes negative, which means that the radical the value of kz itself becomes complex. And so we take the service data, we multiply them by this uh, this exponential here, which is e to the plus or minus z times the square root of the quantity kx squared minus omega squared over v squared. And the thing that's different here is that there's no i. This exponent is real. Okay, it's not imaginary. And so it's not an Euler exponential that creates sines and cosines, right? It's just a regular Growing or damping exponential, and what and of course it's dependent on depth. So the solution grows, you know, unboundedly or is damped exponentially as depth increases. These exponentially dependent solutions are called evanescent waves. I mean, they're they don't correspond to any kind of wave propagation. They're just an artifact. Okay, these waves are are created by uh, evanescent waves are created by waves, you know, real waves which are really in our data. Moving at velocities less than the migration velocity. Okay, so shallower waves or surface waves. You know they're really there. They're real waves, uh, and they don't come from the exploding reflector model. So to get rid of these evanescent solutions, we just you know brutally uh, uh, remove them from the uh, from the omega kx space before we do the downward continuation. So we take the uh, um, we take the uh, the um, we take the uh, the Fourier transform two D Fourier transform data set. We remove the evanescent region that's too close to the kx axis. Okay, we just zero it out. All right, and then we uh, uh, we ju we just keeping hopefully what are just reflections. Right. I mean, we're assuming that we have all P wave reflections. Uh, but that's not always true. We got other waves too, and especially we still have reflections at different at lower velocities, right? So uh, uh, you know we just got to remove it. Of course, now what's happened here is that we've made the the migration, the downward continuation filter, you know, which which before was a gentle uh, all pass filter. We've made it a, a filter that actually takes something out, okay? Which means the migration is no longer perfectly invertible with diffraction. We can invert it, sure. You know, we can invert the the result, but uh, you know, we'll never get this evanescent region back if we just uh, if we if we zero it out. Okay, so that's a little uh, um, a little warning on on something uh, that happens with uh, when you have uh, waves that have too low a velocity uh, in your FK migrations. Okay, uh, they'll produce uh, if you don't remove them. They can produce the uh, these funny exponent evanescent waves, which are not part <coughs> of a uh, migrated uh, section properly. All right, now I'm moving into a uh, another section here, and what I want to do is develop these uh, finite different solutions to uh, the uh, the wave equation. But I want to do it, uh, you know, specifically for our uh, zero offset migration uh, needs. Uh, so we've already decided that uh, the waves are uh, are moving up, right? We've already decided that uh, we have the exploding reflector model, and the waves are coming up from the reflectors to the surface. So we don't need the whole wave equation, right? That's just going to result uh, as it does. You know, if, if we have waves that can go down and come back up and go down again, then we're going to get multiple reflections, right? And that's in our data, right? So hopefully, uh, you know, we've been able to record our data to minimize these multiple reflections. All right, and so if our data we feel are pretty clean and just our primary, you know, composed as, as best we can make it of, uh, you know, primary P wave reflections, then we only need half the wave equation, right? We only need a what's called a paraxial wave equation, a paraxial wave equation. Okay, uh, it's. Uh, you know, it's it's not quite a full wave equation along the z-axis because it's only going to allow waves to propagate up, which is exactly what we want, and that's all we need. Okay, uh, and we don't have to worry about waves propagating down and creating multiples. 
Now the paraaxial uh, wave equation is still a perfect wave equation. It's going to allow waves to propagate along the x direction, right? The other axis, the other spatial axis, in both the positive and negative uh, directions. Okay. So, but but in z, right, for our exploding reflector model, uh, we're going to allow um, uh, only propagation in one direction. And in the x direction, we're going to allow propagation in both directions. All right, so we're going to, we're going to say, all right, we can we can, and, and and the rest of this class really is is using wave equations that uh, you know can describe up or down going waves, you know, just with a change of sign, very simple, but not both at the same time. Okay, so we need these equations. We're going to find them useful. Okay, uh, because uh, well, first they're they're simpler. Than the um, uh, than the full wave equation and easier to find finite different solutions for, so we'll we'll teach ourselves the finite different solutions first with a you know relatively easy case. Uh, so we're using the exploding reflector model also, and it's only got upgoing waves. Okay, so it matches our assumptions pretty darn well. Um, the paraxial equations do not generate the multiple reflections the full wave equations do. Okay, and we're already assuming that our data contain only primary reflections, all right? Big assumption, but uh, one we've been willing to use for a long time. The paraxial equations uh, will allow uh, these finite different solutions to be developed quite easily. And they'll also allow some handling of, of velocity as a function of, of depth, z, and some handling of velocity as a function of x, lateral uh, velocity variation. Uh, another big advantage is that paraxial solutions don't include any evanescent waves, so that's kind of nice. All right, and there are uh, several ways of deriving paraxial wave equations. We can derive them from Fourier transforms of the full acoustic wave equation, okay, uh, or we can derive them from the definition of the ray parameter p, all right, the seismological ray parameter or slowness. Uh, here's a, a, a just something on on the effect of, uh, of our uh, uh, paraxial uh, uh, wave equations. So we're going to develop some new uh, migration methods that we're going to call wave equation migrations, WE migrations. Uh, in this example here, the top panel is zero offset data. Okay, Contains primary reflections only, no direct waves, no multiples. Okay, Only what we assume uh, we want. Okay, Hard to get a data set like this, but uh, uh, but but that that is one of the endeavors of our of our um, um, of our acquisition programs. Okay, you can see the bow ties uh, very nicely here. So there must be some uh, you know sinformal structures that are uh, uh, that are creating those bow ties. We want to construct a migration. All right. Well, we already know these wide angle Fourier domain migration methods and. You know they work pretty well, but there are an awful lot of artifacts scattered throughout the whole solution here, um, and that uh, you know that can be kind of disturbing to our clients or to the geologists. Okay, um, and this is a uh, uh, you know this this is the kind of thing you get with either a uh, Kirchhoff summation migration or a um, um, a uh, uh, FK migration, a uh, frequency wave number migration. Both of them are wide angle, but uh, and you can see that both of them recover, uh, you know, the higher dip parts at least to some degree. You know, where we have really steep dip, they can they can fail, uh, but they're still getting something. Okay, um, but there's just too many artifacts. Okay, it's, it's interfering with our ability to interpret. All right, the uh, one advantage we'll see of uh, of forty of uh, wave equation solutions uh, using paraxial wave equations. Is that uh, uh, the artifacts are only added more locally? Okay, they're not spread throughout the uh, the whole result. Uh, they are, uh, you know, this is a forty-five degree uh, wave equation. Okay, it, it'll turn out the paraxial solutions uh, are are harder to make uh, uh, wide angle, and so we don't usually do that. We we take them up to a certain dip. And so it's not recovering the part of the uh, reflector that's at over 45 degrees dip, but everything else is very nicely recovered. And um, 
you know, the, the blasting out of the uh, artifacts is not so severe as in the Kirchhoff sum. Okay, so let's go through the uh, Fourier definition of a paraxial wave equation. Let's take a scalar wave equation for um, um, rho uh, of x and z equals constant. Okay, so uh, we've already you know bought into that assumption, and so we have uh, d squared p is equal to one over v squared times d squared p d t squared. All right. Now remember the Fourier duals of differentiation, d. Uh, the ddt, the time derivative uh, in the Fourier domain, becomes multiplication by the complex number minus i omega. Okay, ddx becomes multiplication in the Fourier domain by i kx. Ddz becomes multiplication in the Fourier domain by i kz. So to Fourier transform the wave equation, we just substitute in the Fourier duals. We can, and we don't have to do them all at once either. We can substitute them at will on any axis we wish to transform. So here's a, uh, a full uh, wave equation. Again, you know, constant density we know now. Okay, and um, uh, so if we if we substitute in everything, right? So the uh, uh, dp dx, um, you know, becomes uh, minus uh, kx squared times p uh, dp dz d squared p dz squared uh, becomes uh, uh, kz minus kz squared times p, right? And the same, you know, very similar thing on the uh, uh, on the right hand side, one over v squared times minus omega squared times p, and then we just you know divide out the p from every uh, from both uh, uh, sides of the equation from every term, right? We've got our dispersion relation, kx squared plus kz squared is equal to omega squared over v squared. And we can solve for, uh, let's say, kz, right? That's what we need for downward continuation. And so it's going to be plus or minus the square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus kx squared. So we're familiar with that. That's a wide angle solution. So for the exploding reflector model, we select the minus sign on the radical for upgoing waves. And we have kz is equal to minus the square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus kx squared. Now, if we uh, here's uh, here's a tricky uh, maneuver here. Uh, uh, this is a part where you want to pay attention. We can inverse transform this dispersion relation into the physical domain. Okay, and if we can do that, we have a paraxial wave equation. So let's say we uh, inverse Fourier transform over kz. Okay, so uh, we have uh, we multiply. We have the the uh, dispersion relationship here. You know, kz is equal to minus uh, square root of omega squared over v squared minus kx squared. We multiply both sides by i. We multiply both sides by the wave field, right? Same wave field, so we can do that. Isn't that magic, right? That whole complicated wave field, we just bring in like that. Okay? And now you can see that this is i kz times p. That is, okay, i kz times p, that's dp dz. So we have a single um, uh, z derivative. First z derivative is equal to minus i times the uh, square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus kx squared times p. So we could use this as a downward continuation operator, right? For downward continuation, we need we just need that uh, dp dz, right? Um, we could use this. Uh, we could do the same with kx, right? Let's say we wanted sideways continuation. We solve the dispersion relationship for kx, and let's say we'll pick the positive side. Uh, you know, it's equal to uh, the square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus kz squared, right? Multiply both sides by i. Multiply both sides by the wave field p. Uh, very tricky, isn't this? And then uh, I, I wrote it wrong in the original notes. What we have is dp dx, okay, for sideways continuation is equal to minus i times the square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus kz squared times p. Okay. So now, now these examples, you know, notice that under the radical in the Fourier domain, we have the velocity. All right. So these examples are only going to work for constant velocity. Right. We can't vary velocity in space if it's if we're having to use it in the Fourier domain. Okay. Let's try a different kind of approximation. All right, so we have uh, for upward downward continuation with upgoing waves, we have kz 
is equal to minus the square root of omega squared over v squared minus kx squared. Okay, and I'm I'm going to pull out uh, v over omega, uh, and you know multiply v over omega by both sides to get something that's a little more, um, uh, a little more simpler under the radical maybe. So we have v k z over omega is equal to minus square root of one minus uh, v squared k x squared over omega squared. Okay. Now we could completely inverse transform this equation into a PDE if the square root wasn't in the way. Okay, that's the problem. Uh, the square root of a, of a differential operator such as d, d squared dx squared, I mean, that's kind of hard to deal with. Okay, so let's let's try a very crude approximation. Right, we have uh, you know minus minus one times the square root of one minus v squared kx squared over omega squared. What if uh, you know frequency is very high, or velocity is very low, or kx is very small, okay, or kx over omega is very small, right? Then that would leave just one under the radical. So a, a crude approximation here is vkz over omega is about minus one. Okay, I, I admit it, very crude, but actually, you know, here's the full solution for upgoing waves, right? For the negative kz. Right there's the uh, there's the semicircle with that that radical we're, we're familiar with, and here is k z equal to uh, uh, minus omega over v. Right, the radius of this circle is omega over v. Right, and there you know the the circle the purple one. I mean that's our crude approximation, right? And it's exact at uh, at zero theta. Right, that angle is the angle of propagation from vertical. Okay. Up, of course, right. The radius of the circle is uh, omega over v. And, you know, as we as we know, and you know what? I mean, for theta, you know, less than five degrees in either direction, right? This straight line is a pretty darn good approximation. It's actually you know less than one percent wrong. So you know, here we have a brilliantly simple approximation to our circular dispersion relationship. And there's actually a class of important waves that it's correct for. For instance, right? What is again? What is um, the angle of propagation equal to? You know, under the exploding reflector model and the kind of uh, zero offset migration we're doing, it's equal to the dip. So anywhere we have a dip of five degrees or less, we could use this very simple crude approximation, and it's going to work. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, let's let's see. Uh, uh, you know, there's plenty of places where the dip is less than five degrees. They're you know quite useful to explore, and migrate with that. So uh, <clears throat> all right, v k z over omega uh, equal to minus one. That's called the five degree. Well, really, it's a dispersion relation. Okay, so it's a five degree approximation to the circular dispersion relation. Now we're going to look at higher order approximations later. Okay, we'll look at 15 degree, 45 degree, even 60 degrees later on. Uh, since uh, theta is the angle of propagation from the reflector, uh, the order of the approximation sets a limit on the structural dips that we can correctly migrate. Okay, so for instance, if we had a 45 degree dip in our session, we migrate it with a five degree equation, right? What's actually going to happen is that 45 degree dip is going to be represented as something more like five, right? So that's going to be incorrect. You know, it won't it won't represent the uh, the correct um, uh, the correct dip. You know, as we saw in the example uh, uh, further up, right um, up here with the forty five degree wave equation migration, right? It just you know put it all down here at uh, less than forty five degrees dip, and the truly forty five degree dipping part, you know, it's just not there. It's very hard to get anyway. You've got to do everything right, um, and we've only recently learned how to do that. Okay, so let's let's take this simple five degree dispersion relation, and let's uh, let's make it uh, into a uh, PDE, a partial differential equation, in you know fully in the time and space domain. So we have vkz over omega is equal to minus one. And to turn it into a PDE, it's the same process. Okay, there it is. Uh, you know, I'm going to isolate omega out here. I've got kz out here, and I got one over v. All right, multiply both sides by i. Okay, i kz is equal to minus i omega over v. Multiply both sides by the wave field p. Right, 
How tricky is that? IKZ times P is equal to minus I omega over V times P. And of course, you, you see here the IKZ is the uh, uh, is a spatial derivative, single spatial derivative minus I omega is single time derivative. So the uh, using the Fourier duals, the uh, the five degree downward continuation equation is dp dz is equal to one over v times dp dt, which is really uh, you know for one dimensional wave propagation, right, straight up or straight down, that's an exact equation, and it's pretty good for uh, you know even for waves that are propagating it up to five degrees for structural dips that are up to five degrees. You know, which is uh, most of Texas. You know, at least outside the salt domes. So um, uh, this, this, there are settings where this is going to work really well, and you can see how simple this is now. You know, we've taken that complicated uh, wave equation, we've broken it down into something uh, very, very, uh, very, very simple. All right. Um, I'm going to. Uh, stop this here. This was in uh, 21 and uh, tomorrow I'm going to um, uh, continue with uh, uh, with number 22.